Yes. Am I on? Hello, hello. Okay. Well, my topic tonight is last day's deception, and I'm not going to deceive you. I'm going to tell you about the deception. <laughs> but with all of the stuff that's going on, I'm not going to get political. I just want to bring to recollections. When I went to visit Joe and Betsy, I don't know, 13, 14 years ago, something like that, Joe was able to get me an opportunity to speak to one of the classes at Xi'an Petroleum University. Now, these students all speak English, but they were raised under an atheist communist government. And what they've been told is that the government has got everything under control. The government officials know what to do to make things right. So I, I said, okay, I've got one shot at these young people. What can I say? And I talked to them about thermodynamics, that the universe is running down, it's burning out. And they said, what? What can we do about it? I said, absolutely nothing. They said, well, what's going to happen? I said, the universe will die. You'll die. Everything will die. Unless... There's something besides just purely natural processes responsible for the whole thing, that is God. So I was able to share with them a little bit about God. But the one thing that I think is in common is the government has got it under control. You know, there are good, honest government, government officials, and there are also some that might not be quite so much. So we need to pray that the truth will come out, that nobody will be allowed to deliberately deceive us. Okay, so now, speaking of deception, or non-deception. Uh-oh, am I not working? There we go. Okay, Jesus was asked shortly before his crucifixion, uh, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us what shall, when shall these things be? They were talking about the end of the world. And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said to them, the Antichrist is going to come and you're going to have to take a mark. He said, no, take heed that no one deceive you. The main sign of the last days is going to be deception. Paul also told us about the return of the Lord, he said, that day, the day of the coming of the Lord, shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he, has, that he is God. Well, I'm definitely pre-millennial because Paul said this is going to happen. Nobody's ever done that since his time. So in the end time, there will be some guy that sits in the temple and says, oh, I'm God, worship me. No one has ever done that. So how is this person going to get people to follow him? Second Thessalonians, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of righteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth. Everybody has a chance to hear the truth and to love the truth. And if you say, no, I'm not interested in that. Give me something else. Okay. Uh, and so they re receive not the love of tr the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, the devil shall send them strong delusion. No, no. Nope. God shall send them strong delusion. You know, if the devil deludes you, you say, Lord, show me the truth. But if God said, that's it, buddy, you can't believe anymore. You have no hope. So we don't want to be in this number that they should all believe a lie, that they might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So what lie could be so strong that people refuse to love the truth and believe it instead? What could this strong delusion be? Well, you know, the devil knows stick with a winner. The very first lie ever recorded in the Garden of Eden. Hath God said... In the body of the snake, he came to Adam and Eve and said, did God really say that? No, come on, you got that wrong. Is this really the word of God? And then he said, well, even if God said it, it's not true. You're not really going to die. And then why would God try to trick you like this? Because he doesn't want you to become gods. You shall, become, you shall be as gods. You don't need God. 
mankind is going to get better and better, keep evolving. So has the devil's tactics changed? Nah. The first thing he says, has God really said that? Is the Bible the word of God? My topic tonight is not Bible apologetics. You can go look online and, and see my series I did on that. But the Bible has not changed to where we can't tell what God originally said. We know what he said. But then stage two, this is where I'm planning to talk tonight. The Bible is not reliable anyway because it's full of mistakes and contradictions. And stage three, depending on how much time we have. Let me know when my three hours are up. Uh, depending on how much time we have, people will tell you, yeah, you don't need God. Mankind is evolving. You know, I'm in a number of discussion groups on Facebook and, oh, the atheists are just so arrogant. They're smart. The rest of us are stupid. Well, what's the part of the Bible that's under the greatest attack? In the beginning, God created. Oh, no, no, no. See, there was no creation by the word of God. There was... Um, there was a quantum fluctuation out in space from nothing and matter and energy suddenly appeared, boom, and there was a big bang and it started to evolve. Well, this would be sad enough if it was just atheists, but there are at least 12,000 American pastors that have signed on to something called the Clergy Letter Project that said, yeah, we believe God used evolution. I'm so glad our pastor didn't do that. <laughs> so they say, yeah, we believe in God, but what God? Their God either doesn't care if he tells the truth or lied about it on purpose, or their God wasn't smart enough to tell us what happened until Darwin came along and figured it out for him. Well, the Bible talks about in the last days, people will have a form of godliness, but deny its power. What kind of God is that? So uh, I'm going to be talking mainly about UFOs tonight, but first, where did the aliens in the UFOs come from? Where did life come from on Earth? I'm not going to go into all of the details, but this is a very famous experiment where uh, Stanley Miller put together a bunch of chemicals in an apparatus and he started circulating it and he was able to get some amino acids. Ooh. So, you know, the word came out, oh, look, life in the lab. No, no, no. He just did a little basic chemistry in this thing. So you can't use that to put together even the simplest cell and not to go into all of the details. There's a bunch of problems with that scenario. And if anybody wants to stay until three o'clock in the morning, I'll go with the details of it for you, but I'm not going to do that now, but it can't work. Basically life is a chemical impossibility. It could only exist where God wants it to exist. Because of that, uh, Sir Francis Crick, one of the guys that shared the Nobel Prize for his discovery of the structure of DNA. He said, obviously life did not begin on earth. Well, therefore praise the Lord, hallelujah, God must have done it. No, 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 no. He said, there must have been some advanced civilization out in space and they put seeds on rockets and sent them all throughout the universe. It's called directed panspermia. This has actually been the plot of a bunch of science fiction things, even on uh, an episode of Star Trek. So he recognized that it couldn't have happened on Earth, must have been an advanced civilization out in space. Well, okay, this is good science, right? Let's do some experiments to test them. Uh, I don't think you can do that. This is not a scientific idea, it's a philosophical idea. We don't want to admit there's a God, so we say, oh, the UFOs, they have the answers. Do you have to repent? Do you have to give an account for your life? No, the friendly aliens will take care of you. Why is it that people want so much to find life out in space? Well, on this planet, we got a rough time of it. You know, God wants us to be overcomers. Well, in order to be an overcomer, you got to overcome something, which means, as Jesus said, in the world, you shall have tribulation. Oh, we don't like that. I don't like that. How many like tribulation? Good. No liars in here. Uh, but we're faced with all sorts of unpleasant things, suffering, war, death, uncertainty about the future, loneliness, meaningless. But UFOs have the answer. They will lead us to a, a new understanding of life and the universe and so forth, and you never have to repent. 
and maybe they'll be able to extend your life indefinitely. Who knows? There was a great episode of uh, the Twilight Zone one time or the Outer Limits. It was called To Serve Man. Did anybody see that? The aliens come and they're encouraging humans to go with them on board their spacecraft to their planet where they're going to have all of this wonderful life and blah, 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 blah. So they have this book and this one guy sees the book and he finally decodes it and it's called To Serve Man and he opens it and says, oh, it's a cookbook. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> well, the aliens don't require you to repent. God does. And we don't like that. So, oh, okay, let's do the aliens then. We can do anything we want. So why not believe in life in outer space? I must be some kind of a religious fanatic, right? It makes sense to me that the Bible is right in this area. But this is beyond the reach of human testing. Therefore, okay, it's a religious belief. Why do other people believe there is life in space? Because it makes sense to them that the Bible is wrong in this area, which is beyond the reach of human testing. That's every bit as religious to believe there is or is not life out in space. So is there life on other planets? Well, how many planets are there outside our solar system? You're going to hear that there's thousands and thousands and thousands. Have we ever actually seen one with a telescope? No. What we see is pinpoints of light. Even with the Hubble Space Telescope, stars are just pinpoints of light. And we see, oh, the light diminished and increased a little bit. Must have been something orbiting that star, which is a possible explanation, not the only possible explanation. And sometimes the light from the star fluctuates and there must be a planet around it. That's a possible explanation, but not the only one. We've never actually seen a planet around any other star besides our own sun. But it could be. Eh. If that's the case, the ones that have been calculated, this is all computer models and computer simulations. Um, the, those things that are supposed to be planets out there would be so close to that star that water couldn't exist as a liquid, which is a crucial ingredient for life. And also gravity would be so intense that things would get crushed. Out of all of the conditions that are necessary in order for life to, uh, to exist, I got into a discussion with an uncle of mine who was a medical doctor one time, and he said, you know, there could be life in space. I said, if it is, it's based on the element carbon. He said, no, it could be silicon or something like that. How many of you ever studied chemistry? A few of it did. Okay. Well, the only element that will, f that will form long chains is carbon. Silicon will do short chains, but not long chains. So if there is life out there, it has to be based on carbon. And here's the problem. Carbon compounds break down at elevated temperatures. And so if those really are planets out there, they're close enough to their stars that it's too hot for carbon compounds to exist. And then the chemistry of life can occur without oxygen in its gaseous form, but it can't occur without liquid water because you need something to bring in nutrients and take out wastes. And all of these so-called planets would be so close to their stars, they'd be too hot for water to exist as a liquid. It would either be steam, or if it's too far away, it would be frozen water. And either way, it's useless for life. There's a common term among astronomers called the Goldilocks zone. If you hope to have life on some planet, it's got to be in a region that's not too cold, not too hot, or just right. Goldilocks. So, what if there's water in space? You know, we can find out what's out there by pointing telescopes out and analyzing the colors of the light. And so people have said, oh, we found water on Mars, we found water in the moon, we found water out in deep space. Okay, and what does this prove? Water is essential for life, but it's not sufficient for life. Somebody turned to, well, we could just quote it. Psalm 148.4. Praise the Lord, ye waters that are above the heavens. What? The Bible said there's water in space above the heavens? Yeah. So if we find water out there, duh, why is this a big surprise? The Bible said it a long time before we figured out how to do spectroscopic analysis. Okay, ready for a quiz? What's spectroscopic analysis? No. 
Okay, so is there life out in outer space? Bunch of things for you. Can somebody find Romans 5.12, read it for us? Romans 5.12. And the word translated world there is cosmos, which means the universe. Through one man, sin entered the universe, and sin brought death. The whole universe is decaying. Hebrews 9, chapter 20, uh, 9 verses 22 to 24. Can somebody read those three verses for us? Hebrews 9. Twenty-two to twenty-four. Uh, and according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Therefore, it is necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So, why did the heavenly things need to be purified? Because what had happened to them? They had somehow become less than pure. When did that happen? When Adam rebelled against God, he sinned. That even affected heaven. So what happened on this earth was a lot more significant than what we have any idea for. And then Deuteronomy 4.32 uh, says that from one end of the heavens to the other, God has never dealt with anyone the way that he did with Israel. So let's say we've got aliens out there on some planet. And... Humans sinned on earth, and the whole universe is subject to decay. Is that fair to those aliens? If they never sinned, God never gave them the same chance for redemption, would that be just of him? No, of course not. And then when did we sin? After Satan tempted the first man. So if aliens on other planets, they sin too, then what did Satan do? He came here, tempted Adam. Okay, blip, goes over there, tempts. This one, blip, goes over there, tempts this one to bring sin all throughout the known universe and the unknown universe. Uh, okay, and then 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We should read this. Chapter 15. It tells us who Jesus is. Some of you may have heard this before, but it bears repeating. 1 Corinthians 15. says for verse 21 for since by man came death by man also came the resurrection of the dead for as in adam all die even so in christ also be made alive so a man named adam brought sin and death into the world and then christ came along to make us alive but verse 45 of the same chapter and so it is written the first man adam became a living being first adam the last adam became a life-giving spirit or a quickening spirit, depending on your translation. It doesn't say the second Adam, it says the last Adam. So Jesus was the last Adam who came to die to undo what the first Adam did. The first Adam brought sin and death, and the last Adam came to undo that to bring righteousness and resurrection. But if you believe that we came from apes, or if you believe that some aliens out in space seeded earth with uh, with these seeds, the directed panspermia, then what? Did the first Adam really bring death into the world? Of course not. That means the last Adam died because of something that never happened. What kind of savior would that be who's not smart enough to know as he's being stretched out on a cross, hey, wait, wait, Adam wasn't the real guy. I don't want to serve a savior that's, uh, that's not smart enough to figure it out. And then if aliens died out in space, would Jesus, uh, if aliens sinned out in space, would Jesus have to die for them? How many times did he die? Hebrews 7, 27. Once and for all. And 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. Somebody read that for us, please. 2 Peter 3, 10. Bless you. Ah, 
Got it? Cindy's my designated reader. So what happens on this little planet is going to be the center of judgment for the whole universe. Well, wait a minute. The last Zorblat was out there on some other planet. You know, Zorblat sinned, and so Jesus had to go as the last Zorblat to die out there. No, it's what's happening right here on Earth. And if he, oh, okay. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10 you know, everybody knows Ephesians chapter 2, for by grace you're, fa you're saved through faith. Ephesians 3, verse 10, it tells us the meaning of life. Okay, Ephesians 3, 10. Who's my reader? Designated reader? Ephesians 3, 10. To the intent that now the wisdom manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Okay. If you read further on in the book of Ephesians, you'll find out who the principalities and powers in the heavenly places are. They're demons, they're fallen angels. So God is showing off through us, the church, to them. God is beyond time. He knew what was going to happen from the beginning. The whole universe is created for his amusement. And so he knew what was going to happen, and he knew there's going to be a bunch of angels that turn against him, and he allowed it, because there's also a bunch of angels that didn't turn against him. Suppose I want to be loved, and I'm God, and I make a bunch of robots that have to say, I love you, I love you. Is that very satisfying? We have to have the choice not to love God in order for our love for him to be meaningful. Well, likewise, the angels. One third of the angels, we understand from Revelation, turned against God. Two thirds did not. So wouldn't there always be a question in the mind of those two thirds? What's it like? God made humans. He made the church to show off to those angels. How many planets does he need to do that? Just one. Just this little old earth. Here's one of the best arguments against visitors from outer space, SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Since the 1960s, there have been a bunch of scientists that strongly believe in extraterrestrial life. They've been searching the skies for radio signals from space. How many have they found? Not a one yet. They've spent billions of dollars and plan to spend billions of dollars more. Now, if the aliens are really surveying us and they want to you know, learn more about us, who would it make sense from to talk to? The scientists. Well, they never have. But what about UFOs? Most UFOs can be explained by natural causes like reflected light and secret military aircraft and so forth. Some years ago, I went to the air show at the Naval Air Station, and this was the first year the stealth jet was declassified. Previous to that, the pilots couldn't mention anything about it to anybody. So I got to talking to a pilot, and he said that a stealth jet had crashed in the Arizona desert a few years before, and they were all sworn to secrecy, so they couldn't say it was a you know, stealth jet. And he said there were all of these reports in the newspapers about a UFO crashing, and you know the pilots were highly amused by it. Well, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you and I don't know, and we'll never know on this side of heaven. Uh, we retired the SR-71 Blackbird some years ago, and it would go two and a half times the speed of sound. We took it out of service. Hmm. So we don't have anything better? There's a lot of secret military stuff out there, but what about those that you can't explain by physical phenomena? You know, the Bible tells us one of the capabilities of Satan, he has power to assume the form of an angel of light. And when God allows it, he can interact with the physical world and even do things to people's bodies. You read that in the book of Job. God, uh, Satan came to God and said, let me, let me get at him. And God said, okay, you can you know, put sores on him, but you can't kill him. So when God allows it, the devil can interact with people's bodies. He can interact with nature. When Jesus went out on the 
Sea of Galilee and a storm came up and he rebuked it? If it had come from his father, would he have rebuked it? I don't think so. And the devil even had power to pick Jesus up and bring him up to the pinnacle of the temple because God allowed it. When God allows it, this sort of thing can happen. So there have been experiments done by psychologists where they will they'll let the person know, we're going to do an experiment on you, we're going to hypnotize you and plant a memory in you of something that never really happened. And the person agrees to it. Okay, so they hypnotize and they're told you went on a picnic with your Aunt Sally when you were six years old and there was a stream flowing nearby and blah, blah, you know, all this stuff. And when they bring them out of it, the people remember it. Yeah, what do you mean it didn't happen? Of course it did. I remember that as clear as could be. Implanted memories under hypnosis, you'll pass a lie detector test. There have been a number of people that claim that they were taken on board a UFO and they were probed and they've even got little puncture marks and they'll pass a lie detector test. Yeah. Can the devil deceive you? Can he hypnotize you? Absolutely. I want to recommend something to you. I've got three copies of this DVD out in the hallway. Sounds like a commercial, right? Uh, it's called Alien Intrusion. And they go into a whole lot of detail on this, almost two hours worth. So, you know, Gary found it kind of boring. Started maybe after 30 minutes or so. But they interviewed a bunch of people that have had experiences of being abducted by aliens and they remembered it and they would pass lie detector tests and all of this stuff. And um, so in general, they were not victims just one time. I didn't know that. Once a person had this happen the first time, it's probably going to happen again and again and again and again. And of course, it would be a terrifying experience. But some of them, you find this uh, near the end of the DVD, some of them later became Christians. And the next time that the UFOs, the aliens came, they said, Jesus, help me. And they said the aliens would screech and vanish. Why would aliens be terrified at the name of a carpenter that lived 2,000 years ago from a different planet? What do you think those aliens are? I think they're demons. It's a demonic deception. So I've got three copies of this out in the hallway. You know, take it home, watch it, bring it back when you finish. I'd say start after about 30 minutes or so because it's long, right, Gary? It's very long. What's that? But wait, there's more. And if you study the UFO reports from about 70 years ago, you'll hear about little green men in flying saucers. Now they're going to be the greys, the aliens that have these big heads. And they're gray. That's the term nowadays uh, among ufologists. And they have these incredible ships capable of astonishing maneuvers. Well, either the aliens and their ships have evolved a tremendous amount in the last 70 years, or else the devil knows what we'll accept. And he gives us just enough that we'll still accept it. So here's a few problems with the idea that aliens could get to us from outer space. You know, I'm a physics guy. I love physics. And physics has been in development for centuries, but in particular, for the last hundred years or so, and we've done so many experiments on stuff, the nearest star is about four and a half light years away. That is at the speed of light. It takes about four and a half years to get here. And we don't think there's any planets around that star. The closest ones would be like, you know, 20, 30 light years away that we think maybe there's a, a planet around it. So how would the aliens get to us from that star? it would take them at least, if they could get to the speed of light, it would take them at least 20 or 30 years. They're gonna to have to bring a lot of food and water and toilet paper on their spaceships <laughs> to be doing a 20, and fuel to be doing a 20 or 30 year trip. And how would you get close to the speed of light? There's something called a particle accelerator. We could take an atom and get it up like 99% of the speed of light. It takes an incredible amount of energy to accelerate something that much. 
Y'all ever heard the famous equation E equals MC squared? The more mass you have, the more energy you have to put in. The more energy you put in, the more mass you get, and the harder and harder and harder it gets to accelerate. We can't get anything to the speed of light. We can get one atom close to the speed of light. That's one atom. Suppose you got a whole spaceship. How much energy is it going to take to get that close to the speed of light? Well, however much it takes when they get close to Earth, now they got to slow down. They got to send out just the same amount of energy. And then afterward, they got to go back and they got to stop over on the other side. You know, as far as we understand from experimental physics, it's not possible. It's the stuff of science fiction. You'll see this on Star Trek and Star Wars and, oh, let's go through a, a black hole and a wormhole and a tesseract and all of this stuff. It's great science fiction. I love reading that kind of stuff, but it's not science fact. We just can't get things anywhere near that fast. So we would have to be totally wrong about the things we have learned through direct observation and testing in order for the aliens to actually find some way to do space warps and stuff like that. Well, I personally don't believe it, sorry. <laughs> Even though I like sci-fi. Yeah, you go. Okay, so the people that have been abducted by aliens over and over and over again, those that have gotten saved, when they called on the name of Jesus the next time, the aliens vanished. A lot of times they would screech and vanish. That tells me something about the name of Jesus and how these aliens are going to respond to it. Here's this little guy, human carpenter that lived in a little town called Nazareth in an obscure area of the world 2,000 years ago, and you use his name and the aliens flee? Who is this? I think we know who this is. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things where in heaven. Oh, yeah, aliens and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, Satan has fallen several times from here to here to here to here to here. Okay, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. But then he was still able to get back and forth from earth to God, earth to God at the time of the book of Job. Well, in Revelation, he's going to be cast down and strict, strictly confined to earth. So right now, maybe he's able to get into the heavenly places, but he won't be able to. He's going to be confined to earth, and then he's going to fall one more time into the pit. So I don't want to be with him. So what was the third part of the biggest lie ever told? You shall be as gods. We will not. We will never be gods. People are falling for the devil's lie, his same old lie. We need to not fall into that trap. Let's see, how am I doing on time? Yeah, I have a few more minutes. Yes, sir. And if it was coming from deep space near the speed of light and it had to decelerate, it would radiate an incredible amount of energy. And we can detect energy, uh, thermal imaging and so forth. And we've never seen any of that. Yeah, right. Good point. Never seen any indications that the aliens are decelerating as they approach Earth. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, some of it... Um, I'm sure the devil can manipulate light and they say it moved across the sky at incredible speed. Well, if I take my laser beam and I shine it, whoosh, whoosh, look at that. It was going 7,000 miles an hour up there. Yeah. But in my hand, it was only going that fast. You know? yeah. So he knows how to deceive. He's been practicing it ever since. Of, what's that? An angel of light. Sure. So there's a lot of stuff that has a natural explanation. Not all of it does. In that case, the explanation, I think, is demonic deception. 
Okay, so since I still have a few minutes, um, directed panspermia says that the aliens out in space sent the seeds to Earth and they began to evolve. Well, evolve into what? This was even an episode of Star Trek one time where they explained why there's so many humanoid species out throughout the whole universe, you know, with two arms and two legs. It's because of the aliens sending out the, the space seeds. Okay, well, where do these aliens come from? Hmm. The problems, the chemical problems with the origins of life that I just breezed right over are assuming perfect ideal circumstances, which don't exist. But where do the aliens come from? I don't know. We don't know. We just have to believe it. But then after the seeds landed on Earth, where's the evidence that humans came from monkeys and apes? And Gary was commenting, I have monkeys crawling on my tie. Well, that's deliberate tonight. Did anybody see a debate between Bill Nye, the science guy? He, he calls himself the science guy. It's the evolution guy. That's his thing. Uh, and Ken Ham of the uh, Institute for Creation, uh, of whatever, Creation Answers in Genesis. That's it. That's the ticket. Well, Bill Nye presented all these things. He says, well, look, there's our ape ancestors. See, see, see. So he went through it, took about a second. I did a freeze frame, and I went through every single one of those to find it. Okay, is this really some kind of an ape man? No. Nope. These are what those skulls are. Every one of them is either an ape or a man. They're not an ape man. But Bill wants you to think that you came from apes. And the apes came from the seed that the aliens put on the earth way back when. But according to the Bible, where do fossils come from? Well, of course, the Bible says 10 times in the creation account, everything was created to reproduce after its kind. Most creationists believe that God put creatures in ecological communities because in the world today, we have lions and all of these things living together. And then we have coral reefs for the different ecological communities. So most creationists say, yeah, it would have been like, like it is at the present. There's probably about four dozen different types of ecological communities in the world today. And when you look through the fossil record, you find about four dozen different types of communities, of communities of fossils. So God would have placed them into ecological communities. And then the flood came along, which buried them and ripped them apart. Very, very, very seldom do you find an intact land animal. The ones out in the ocean, yeah, it looks like the mud just came and covered them all. And you got all these nice things buried on land. No, they were ripped apart. I'm going to show you some of the fossils, and you don't find complete fossils. So those that were the most intelligent and the most mobile would have probably been able to avoid being buried for the longest amount of time. Now, according to evolution, it's a very different thing. The evolutionists deny that there was ever a worldwide flood, and I'll show you the prediction Peter made about that. Fossilization started shortly after life began, something would uh, die near a body of water and fall over into it, and it would gradually be covered over with sediment. The sediment could harden sometimes into a fossil over millions of years. And then if the sediment began to erode away, finally the fossil comes back and can be seen. So the reason that some animals were not fossilized and other animals were is just random chance. They just happened to die in the wrong place at the wrong time. This is what the Bible tells us to look out for in the last days. Um, I believe that one of the things Brother Rusty has touched on is a lot of people say, oh, Jesus is not coming back, right? Not literally. Well, this is what Peter told us. A fisherman knew about this a couple thousand years ago. First of all, you must, uh, you must understand this, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own passions and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things have continued as they were from the beginning of creation. So they said, where's the promise of his coming? That is, Jesus is not literally physically coming back to earth. The scoffers are going to say that. He says, you know, second thing they say, since the beginning of creation, all things have continued as they were. He's talking about geology. Y'all believe me? Well, let's read the next sentence and you'll see. Yeah, he's definitely talking about geology. This is something called uniformitarianism. 
If you ever take a geology class, they're going to tell you the present is the key to the past. Well, here's what you ought to say. How do you know that? Well, it just is. It's in my textbook. But the scoffers are going to deliberately ignore the fact that by the word of God, heavens existed long ago and an earth formed out of water and by means of water through which the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. So the scoffers are going to say, Jesus is not literally coming back. Everything always happens at slow, steady rates, and there's never been a worldwide flood. That's the key to saying that the fossils are so very old, saying that there's never been a worldwide flood. So <clears throat> students are going to be told that there are mountains of fossil evidence proving human evolution. It's a complete lie. There are tremendous numbers of fossils that were buried in Noah's flood and ripped apart. The technical word is they were disarticulated. Now, how many primates would you think have ever lived? Primates would be monkeys and apes and humans. Well, there's 8 billion people in the world today. So add them to all of the people that have lived in the past, plus add all the humans, plus add all the monkeys. You got billions and billions and billions of things that are called primates. Well, if that's the case, we ought to find a whole bunch of their skeletons, right? There, in the whole world, there are about maybe four or five complete skeletons of primates, of monkeys and apes. Uh, these are some of them. That's called Darwinius massillae. And it was really amazing to find it because, wow, we don't have any complete skeletons. These other ones are put together from individual bones found at the place. And okay, well, let's do a puzzle and put this together, put this together. And um, there's a Nothartus, a Nothartus and an Archisebus. The Archisebus is still broken apart, but all the bones are there. And there's about two more that we've got a fairly complete skeleton for out of billions. And they're all buried in water deposited sediment all around the world. What does that sound like? Sounds like a big old flood. So the vast majority of fossils of primates you know, monkeys, apes, humans, are teeth. These articles I've been reading, I couldn't tell you how many paleontology articles I've read in the last few months, but there have been so many times where somebody finds one tooth or two teeth and they describe, oh yes, here's um, Amphipithecus mogongensis. And you know, you read the details, you say, what? That's one tooth? So there are a few things that we've got skulls for. Uh, most of the fossils are teeth. And then of the remaining amount, you know, there's fragmented skulls, there's broken skulls. And these are some of the most complete skulls known. Egyptopithecus and Sahelanthropus and Sebapithecus, they're broken skulls. They don't even have the whole thing all together. Or sometimes we find the jaw separated, usually more like a piece of a jaw with one or two teeth. And they're always buried in water deposited sediment water deposited mud, wherever you find them. So it was estimated back in the 1980s that all of the fossils of things supposedly leading toward humans, you know, we're told there's mountains of fossil evidence. No, all of the fossils would barely cover a billiard table. Or they could be placed inside a single coffin with room to spare. Well, the scientists have been continuing to dig and they probably discovered a few thousand more. Now it might take two billiard tables or two coffins, but that's it. This is the kind of thing that you find much, much, much more often fragments of jaws like those, but usually it's teeth or it's a little piece of a bone here broken off and scattered all around. So we don't find intact animals. We find broken things in water deposited sediment. My point is, do you think he came from an ape? I would hope that you recognize the evidence indicates, no, you didn't come from an ape. Humans didn't come from an ape. But the passage Peter wrote before, I think, tells why people want to deny the flood. They want to deny God, the creator, because by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist have been stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. I was talking to a young lady one time, witnessing to her about death. And she said, I don't like to think about that. Well, I don't care if you don't like to think about it. It's going to happen. You're going to die. So what are you going to do to get ready for it? A friend of mine over in 
Africa, people were talking to him after a big um, tsunami hit Indonesia and killed 100,000 people. And he said, people are saying, this is so, un so unfair. And I asked him to ask those people, how many times did those people die? How many times would they have died if not for a tsunami? Death, death is the fairest thing there is. It comes to every single one of us, rich and poor, unless Jesus comes back and interrupts human history. So instead of complaining it's unfair, what we ought to be doing is getting ready for it and helping others to get ready for it. So Jesus said, there shall arise false Christs, false prophets, hmm, like Darwin, and shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I've told you before. So God told us we didn't come from monkeys or apes. We didn't come from space aliens. Jesus Christ is Lord of all, even the demons. Amen. Yes, sir. Yeah, just, just, uh, if you look, oh. testing one, two. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, looking at just appearances, uh, appearances are deceiving too, but, sure. uh, once many, many, many years ago, I worked in a shipyard and at the end of a shift one time, I watched a, a, a guy, uh, a sandblaster take off his hood and when he when he did my jaw dropped because there standing before me was a neanderthal yeah absolutely <laughs> I mean, he had all all of the characteristics absolutely yeah the neanderthals were human in every way but they tended to have protruding eyebrow ridges and their jaw tended to jut out if you've ever seen andre the giant yes. that's what neanderthal looked like yeah acromegaly um actually i have a cousin i hope this never gets to him but i have a cousin that kind of looks like that and then my sister-in-law is a Quechua Indian from South American and she looks very much like the artist reconstruction of Homo erectus fully human in every way it's just the people that write the textbooks and produce the movies are Americans and Europeans so if they don't look like me they're not human they are we're all human any other questions input Uh oh. Okay. Anyway, anyway um, it, it's on a theology website uh, for Assembly of God pastors. And even though I'm not an Assembly of God pastor, you know, yep. we, we believe similar things. But one of the great big discussions right now is the age of the earth. Yeah. Uh, among them. And um, apparently, there's quite a number that do not believe in young earth creation. Right. I mean, even among these Pentecostal members. Right. And the basis of that is what Peter wrote about. In the last days, scoffers will say everything happens at slow, steady, gradual rates. There's never been a worldwide flood. Because if there was a worldwide flood, which there was, that cuts about three and a half billion years off the time scale in one year. And the flood is the best explanation for the fossil record. There is somewhere in excess of 800 billion fossils out there that we know of, not thousands, not millions, not billion, at least 800 billion, maybe closer to a trillion. Now, the vast majority of them are sea creatures, which would be expected from the flood because the things in the water would get buried first. There's very sparse uh, fossil record of land animals, though. And so the idea of millions of years depends on saying there was never a worldwide flood. Okay, well, you want to close us out in prayer? Or? Uh, <laughs> I'll close us in prayer. That was good, Dave. That was interesting. We showed that, uh, that UFO. Right. We showed it so at the church. There's three copies out in the hallway. Go get them. Takes you a couple sections. Yeah, yeah. alien one. intrusion. Uh, it's going to take you, you know, it's almost two hours long. Yeah. But wait. There's you more. order it now. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's pray. 
Well, Father, we thank you for just the opportunity to gather tonight and to study together. Thank you, Lord, for this encouraging word reminding us that your word is absolutely true. No matter what modern science may say or how they may contradict your word, Lord, we know that your word is established forever and, and forever true. Help us to remember these things. Help us, Lord, to proclaim these things and be ready to defend what we believe. Father, bless us as we go. Use us for your glory. Pray it in Jesus' name. Don't forget.